Next up, we have Gabri Waddell. He's going to talk us through the history and the evolution of audio plugins. So, Gabri, welcome. All right, thank you. Uh, so this is Evolution of Audio Plugins and Best Usability Practices. Uh, my name is Gabri Waddell. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank Roly for having me here in London and uh, th thank, thank the sponsors personally, Google and Native Instruments. I'd also like to thank Andrew Jerram, who's on the forums and very active. He's just such a nice guy and, and helps out so many people, so I just wanted to say thanks to him uh, since he is, he is not here. So I own a, a mastering studio in Memphis called Stonebridge Mastering, and so that's my background. Mastering is what drew, drew me into music and audio, uh, and you know, is where I found my love for, for audio. Uh, worked with a lot of different artists over the years, Ministry, uh, The Bark Hayes, Lil Wayne, uh, Public Enemy, uh, lots of different artists uh, across a range of musical styles. And in Memphis, it's, it's kind of like that in Memphis. Memphis is a city that's all about different styles of music. If you ever visit there or have heard of, uh, heard of this music town, uh, it's, uh, it's known as the birthplace of rock and roll and the home of the blues. And of course, it also had a, a big role in soul music. The two big labels, uh, when you think of soul, are Stax and Motown. And Stax was the more raw, the more soul of soul. That's the way I think of it. <laughs> So uh, Memphis is quite a town, and uh, so that's sort of where I'm coming from. You know, it's sort of, uh, I think it's a bit relevant as I uh, talk about my experience here. So uh, I wrote a book called Complete Audio Mastering Practical Techniques. Uh, it was published by McGraw-Hill. Uh, it was a way to sort of explore my knowledge in mastering and also share it with others. And I. Uh, made a plug-in, uh, uh, developed a prototype called Refinement that I licensed to Brainworks and Universal Audio, and from what I understand, it's one of their best-selling mastering plug-ins of the past year, one of the best-selling uh, industry-wide. So uh, this talk is going to be, uh, it's going to start with the evolution of audio plugins. So when I think of audio plugins, when I, when the, at the very beginning of it, I, I think of the analog boxes that actually literally plugged in. I mean, they, there was a jack, there was a plug actually plugged in. Uh, the, that's where things started to get going. It was these isolated things, and people would collect them, and some of them would become classics. You know, to me, that, that's just amazing that a device like that can become classic and a hit, almost like a song would. You know, it's, it, it's really something. And they're, they're ubiquitous. Any, any studio you go in, you're going to see analog gear. If you go into a studio and you don't see that, you wonder if you're really in a studio. I mean, that's what you have to have for a studio. Um, and with the previous talk, I totally understand why people would emulate these things, because they are classics. And if you emulate them, of course, you're going to have the value of those things that comes through. So uh, th this is sort of where it starts, uh, I, I feel like. Studio culture started to develop with, uh, with these analog devices. So the first ever software plugin was made for a Univac word pro uh, the mainframe uh, in the 1970s. It made its buffer available, and there was a plugin plugins that could work with it. So uh, this is the very first instance of any software plugin uh, ever. The first ever audio software plugin was the Waves Q10 in 1992, and it sort of stuns me to think back that you know, that it was 1992, as, as quite some time ago. And also it's stunning when I found this picture of floppy disks. The, this plugin is actually literally on floppy disks. That's just uh, mind blowing to me. So one thing that really is amazing is that Waves Q10 is still on sale today. You can still buy that now. And what that tells me uh, is that Plugins can have a long tail. They're not something that you can that you necessarily come out with and it's just gone. Some apps, I think, are, are consumable very quickly and they may not have a long life. But plugins are the type of thing that can stick around and they can become classics, just as their analog counterparts did in the past. And it, that's, you know, it really speaks to me. And, you know, in what we're doing in creating plugins, you guys can create classics. Some of you already have. And it's a space where that can happen. 
Music is that kind of thing. Once you get a following, that thing can stick around forever. So as analog and digital, the pl plugins started coming out, we all saw this sort of graphic, this smooth analog wave that was just perfect and organic and it was right, you know. That's, this is, it was what sound was supposed to be. And this, then this specter came around, digital audio, and it was this boxy wave thing that everyone hated and it was defiling music. It was destroying everything that we really <laughs> loved. <laughs> It took all the soul away from music. I, was, I can't think of anything better than Darth Vader holding auto-tune, and that's the way people <laughs> think about it. Then it came and just, it, it took everything away. It took everyone over into the dark side. Uh, and people, they made a sports analogy around that time as if uh, using auto-tune and that kind of thing was, it was like cheating. It was like a sportsman that was cheating. And society had to come to grips with this sort of thing. You know, this, that kind of studio magic just wasn't going on before. And as uh, editing and all these things started to uh, come about with Pro Tools, it, it really did fundamentally change the way that people thought about music and, and uh, listened to music. So now it's a new day. It's, people are seeing, a, a, it, things have really transformed. Uh, as people have accepted digital audio and what's come along with it, uh, it's, it, it's something, you know, people, they disliked, uh, they disliked things so much, but after it had a time to gel and develop and all the things that were able to, to, um, to, to come out, uh, people, even, uh, you know, analog stand, guys that just really used analog and they were staunch about it, they began to accept it and some, a lot of them are using it now. So the analog versus digital debate, digital has mostly won. And it's a time where we can create new classics and, it, it can, and it's uh, much less difficult to do that than in previous years. It, we're just not dealing with the forces that we were dealing with before. And another thing that's inspirational about the plugins is this uh, that I saw at NAM earlier in the year, beginning of the year. And now this is retail sales of, uh, of plugins and, uh, and, saw, and loops. And you can see that the, those numbers are going up. They're really going up. And now this is only re retail sales, and I think it only represents a small fraction of the sales that actually are going on, 25 million of retail sales. And I, now that's pretty low. That's probably a tenth of what is actually going on. Most of the sales are happening directly from the developer to the client. They're not selling. Most people aren't going to a store to go and purchase a plug-in. But what we can know from this is that plugins are on the rise. That is, is something that is growing. And I feel like people are hacking less. They're doing, they, they want the connection with the developer. They want to, uh, they want to have that. They, and also, they're just, there's a number of campaigns where people are trying to get people to license their software illegally. And I think that is starting to take hold. People are wanting to do that. And I think that's another effect in how uh, the plugin market has continued to grow as it is. So I went to the uh, AES convention a few weeks ago, uh, a number of weeks ago, and I talked to some of my peers and uh, some guys who are just uh, fantastic uh, audio engineers. And uh, I'm gonna play a video of some of the interviews I did with them to talk about what they th think about how plugins have evolved and what they think uh, the future will be. And one thing I want to stress uh, as we go into this video is the appreciation that I have for these users and the music producers and the, the people who do that kind of work, uh, the people that, you know, that I'm designing software for. Uh, some of these guys, uh, they are just amazing people and they motivate me to want to uh, do better work and make the best tools for them. And I think that uh, central to the design is, uh, is that deep, appre deep appreciation for those that do uh, work with the tools we create. So uh, this is a, a video that I shot there, if I can get it up, get it going here. All right. I had two different experiences, two different feelings about even the existence of plugins. And the first one was like unlimited creativity, this is so awesome. And then when I started seeing ones that looked like representations of actual recording equipment, I thought, oh, what a shame. <laughs> That's terrible. 
I've kind of half reversed that, but it's still, it's funny. Like those are two different things in my mind, you know. Well, like the first thing is that they were trying to trying to recreate things that are already there. I'm a hardware guy, and I actually really like using the hardware if I can. Maybe we shouldn't be putting effort in trying to emulate something that from the past. Why don't we take advantage of it and do the things that it's good at? Well, if the future, if it's the future of audio, why doesn't it look different? Why it still looks like consoles and and mixing platforms, and, and it still has a simulacrum of, you know, say tape flow, linear time. So maybe there's something wrong with it. So we're trying to take advantage of what technology has brought all, all over these years and create intelligent pro audio processing tools. So, for example, the products that are already out there from our company have a sense of intelligence. Now I have problems to solve when I'm recording. And, and I'm always looking for ways to solve those kinds of problems. But I think this is one thing we forget uh, maybe sometimes the, in, in designing plugins is that a lot of people that are using these might be, um, I'll loosely use the term hobbyists, and have time to explore and, and play with stuff and find things they enjoy. But for someone working in professional realm all the time, I don't have time to test them out and play with them and, and experiment and find cool things. I'm in the, I'm being paid by the hour to work, and believe me, when that, when that day is over, I don't stay after and play with plugins to see what they do. I go home to my wife and hang out. Sometimes having too much control is not necessarily a good thing. Think of problems that are there for decades and they were not possible to solve in the analog domain and find solutions for that problems in the digital domain. That's the inspiration. You need real world feedback and how that plugin is really solving the problem. And solving a client's problem, in my case, is it really solving my productivity workflow problem, or is it solving, and is it solving the problem of the client sonically? Some of them you can't resize the plugin. You're on a tiny little screen, you don't want to take up all this real estate. Or you're on a big screen and you want to be able to see what's going on. Uh, right now, everyone in my business is talking about loudness. So a plugin that deals with loudness control or deals with loudness metering or monitoring is uh, something that we wouldn't have been looking for just a year or two ago. So uh, We try to think of problems that were always there. Like take for example microphone bleed. It's there since the first multi-track recording, right, of drums. And there was just no way to solve it apart from taking very, very careful steps in setting up the mics, using the correct mics, and then the only signal processing tool available was a noise gate, which is a switch, you know. So you have this problem which is there for so many years, and the motivation was, now we're going to solve it with signal processing. A, um, a, fine, a fine control mode is almost always needed because this the linear or rotational um, control it sometimes doesn't produce enough a resolution with the screen res with the resolution of my mouse. So a you know a, a modifier key that allows you to go into fine tune mode is uh, is sometimes really useful. The brain reacts as a pendulum. We have the technical side and the creative side, and when you're trying to be technical, you're trying to be creative, and you got an idea to do something, but you got to figure out how to do it. Oh, what was I doing again? I was trying to get to here. So here's how I route this. The pendulum doesn't swing nearly as far back and forth. The gadgets initially sell, but tools really live on. Um, uh, a, a gadget, you know, that solves one little problem, you know, right here and now, you know, is definitely something to get you started with. But a tool that you, that becomes an integrated part of your workflow is something that you know that you base your you almost base your career on the sound or the operation of it. So kind of got to decide whether you're making a gadget or a tool in my, in my mind. So I really love some of those comments, especially when Michael Romanowski talks about the pendulum swing. And I think about that flow when I'm tackling a problem. And, you know, if you're trying to be creative and you're trying to be technical, you just don't, you can't get the height of either uh, if, if you get too focused in, in either direction. So uh, those kinds of comments, that, those are the types of users 
that I want to make devices for. Those are the people that I'm thinking about. There was a video the other day, uh, yesterday, uh, that was uh, uh, showed some producers uh, that were not, you know, I don't know, I don't know about those producers. <laughs> but th these are the types of users that that I'm thinking about now. That inspire me to be passionate about making tools. Uh, so uh, yeah. Um, so yes, uh, if, if you're thinking about processing and synthesis or th things to make tools uh, to, to do what their actual uh, uh, purpose would be, uh, th in the NAM report they said that part of that boost in the sales was fueled by a, a new interest in electronic dance music. So that's one area where there's some research to know that there is, there's an increased market there. That's absolutely something to build things for. Um, and the one thing I really love is there's an open source community just like there has never been. Um, you, you know, some people will make things like a compressor that, you know, uh, the, the 50 millionth compressor. But what you can do is if you make that compressor, it can be part of something that is more complex. So later on, uh, it's just a part of something else. Um, in, uh, infinite impulse response filters, they just weren't available as available as they are now. I mean, there's one built into Juice. There's the Vinnie Falco DSP stuff, which is uh, amazing. Uh, loudness units, as Scott Hall mentioned, loudness is a big deal in the mastering industry. And uh, so anything that involves that, LUFS metering is incredible. It's the, it's the most strongly correlated metering that we have with loudness. Uh, and if you want to create one or have one, uh, there's an open source one. And of course, this video will be available after the conference, so you can get it from there. Uh, Samuel is a, a great programmer. I wanted to mention him, him here. Uh, there's a number of things linked here that uh, he created and have made open source. Uh, convolution reverb, who would have thought when that came out there could be one that you could just implement and maybe make part of something uh, larger and greater. Uh, there's a binaural processing uh, that's available. Of course, the huge wealth of things that's available at musicdsp.org. And I just uh, visited Queen Mary University of London. I misspelled it. I just kind of uh, added this this morning after I toured. Uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, and they have a, a, a ton of stuff that's available there that can be implemented and explored if uh, someone is new uh, in audio software trying to implement something that already exists. No need to recreate the wheel. We can funnel our, funnel our efforts into things that are, uh, that are usable and that help people uh, to flow. Um, so with user interfaces, as was a huge theme uh, whenever you talk to uh, audio engineers, they want less features, which is sort of counterintuitive. They want less. They want things that are simplified. They want things that help with their workflow. One thing that uh, wasn't around in the early plugins was slide out menus. So if you have a lot of features that you want to exist, that you can hide them in a slide out menu. And there's ones that are available. There's a, a, a link here where you can get one. And uh, so, Skeuomorphic versus flat design. Uh, of course, skeuomorphic ha design was everywhere when plugins first began. I mean, that was the most common. Uh, it, was, it was very common. Flat design is trending. It's it's just going to continue to trend up. Flat design is is pretty much where it's at. But I think skeuomorphic design is going to be here to stay because uh, to to some degree it's going to be lesser, but it's still going to be here because music is always owing to the past. Music is something that always involves history. If you talk to a musician, they're usually going to tell you what their influences are. They kind of define themselves by their influence. Uh, so uh, music is always like that. And skeuomorphic interfaces, they're something that have that allow you to also be owing to the past uh, to emulate that classic or have people let people have the feel of working with the things where they're familiar. Um, and that was mentioned in the last talk, which I uh, certainly identified with. So uh, my goal in life really is to raise the musical experience for listeners and, uh, and, and through my work. Uh, and so in audio software or in mastering. And in software, you know, that's really what it's all about uh, for me. Uh, and you know, it's about solving problems. It's about making efficient tools for the for the people who are going to have to use those tools, and, but not too efficient. I think if it's just one knob, sometimes I think that can, you know, that's uh, it's like a, a bit of an insult. It's like a painter that is. If, you wouldn't buy a painter paint by numbers. You give them a good, you know, some great colors and a and a paintbrush. You know, uh, so you know, efficient but not too efficient. 
And, uh, you know, and the ultimate goal, again, is high quality experience for the listeners, the musical experience. So uh, thank you to Rolly for having me here. And uh, thank you guys for, for being here. Great stuff, some good advice there. Um, questions, we have a couple of minutes. It wasn't so technical, so, <laughs> yeah. You, talk, you talked about uh, having less features rather than more. That's quite difficult for us because we always like to add more and add complexity, that's kind of what we do. How do you make a decision about what to take out or what to hide from the user and what to expose and show them? For me, as a mastering guy, uh, I've been making mastering plugins. Uh, that's sort of my focus. So it's about, uh, for me, it's, it's about putting it into my workflow and seeing what I actually am using. Uh, if I notice that I'm using some of the features and not using other ones, then those other ones can maybe be tucked away or maybe they don't need to be there at all. Uh, uh, that's one way. And w what Scott was saying in the video about the user feedback and uh, in interacting with users, I think that's I think that's vital. If you're if you're not actually working in music every day, uh, then you that feedback can give you everything, and is going to make sure that whatever you're developing is going to connect with the user base. So, yeah. uh, in your own plugins, are you using any kind of virtual analog simulations? or other techniques you might or might not want to talk about? Oh, no. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did not uh, do, I haven't done any, uh, any analog emulations. I love the talk that, uh, that was just given on that subject. But for me, with my refinement plugin, there's a tube graphic that's in it. And you know, with it, I was more saying, it was sort of a statement that when people are thinking about tubes, they usually think about warmth, or they think about addressing harshness with a tube, which sometimes a tube can do that, sometimes it doesn't, a tube could do different things. Uh, so, but I know that's the perception that's there, so I wanted to sort of match the perception. Uh, but no, uh, actually emulating analog, uh, not an area that I've gotten into. One more quick question. Um, on the subject of skeuomorphic interface design, uh, you said it's going to stay as through a tradition or something like that, um, but most of the people in the video seem to disagree and seem to think it was a bad thing and from the start had been a barrier to good interface design. Mm -hmm. And I agree with them. I was just wondering if you could speak to that. And maybe it's a good thing if it disappears. <laughs> yeah, may maybe it would be, uh, but I think, that it, I think it will stick around. Uh, it, people, saw they, they talk about it negatively, you know, ev even the guys in the video, but I, and you notice Larry C Crane said, I've half reversed that. And I'm, I can guarantee you, he, have, he had probably has something that uh, is some emulation that he uses sometimes. Uh, virtually everyone has something like that. And again, I think it's going to trend down, but I think it'll exist to some degree. It's not like, uh, you know, the early notepad software where it looked like a notepad. Uh, that's, that's not coming back. But in, <laughs> In music, something that looks like an amplifier, looks like those things, again, music is always owing to the past. So I think we'll always see some of that in audio software, music software. Good stuff. I'd love to stand here for another hour talking about skeuomorphic interfaces and how we can kill them. But, we're, <laughs> but we, uh, we need to break for coffee now. Uh, the, next, the keynote will be Andrew Bell at 5.15. But before that, thanks again, Gabri. Thank you.